alt heavy. Right. right. We just they start to switch for alt heavy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually going to do probably the part of this, and I'm going to have Dr. Yes. Heavy talk about the rest of it. And Dr. Ganti, our superhero, is um, surrounding this whole thing. She, this is kind of one of her babies, so she's going to be everywhere, and she may not make it there. So we're going to take this. Oh, I need a mic. That killed him. Don't judge me quickly, right? There you go. Yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> so that always makes me. The, the drop of the mic and all that kind of stuff, and walking out the wrong room, and yeah, okay. Just a quick, uh, I guess I'll pull this off uh, as a quick address. Okay, uh, Paul is part of the faculty over at the University of Central Florida, um, but his key role here is the medical director for Polk County, Florida, yeah, in uh, down sort of Central Florida area, just below Orlando. Uh, Eighteen percent of those are under. I'm sorry. Um, about eighteen percent are under the age of thirteen. Uh, it's got about, oh, I would say, uh, twenty-one percent uh, African American, uh, Hispanic, about fifteen percent African American, uh, and about forty-three thousand median income. Uh, Seventy percent of the people works work, live in homes versus uh, whatever, and uh, so just like regular USA, you know, just mixed community, etc. And the average income is about forty-three thousand, but fifty percent of the people are at a college or graduate school level that they've completed. So it's an uh, interesting community, and it's just it's a lot a lot of diverse things. But one thing they do have in common is uh, with the rest of us is a lot of pediatric cardiac arrests. Okay, surprisingly Good. more than we thought we would. And if you look at pediatric cardiac arrest, it's 5,000 out of hospital cardiac arrests a, a year. Uh, survival rates are less than 9%. The number one cause of cardiac arrest is asphyxia. Asphyxia causes uh, decrease of oxygen delivery to vital organs, eventually basically cell death, anoxic brain injury. The number one cause of respiratory failure is asphyxia. So I really want to stress this because this is what we did to change our cardiac arrest output results. So, you know, well, the causes of pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, SIDS, trauma, submersion, poisoning, severe asthma, we know this. There's five critical factors that will really affect pediatric arrest survival. The environment, is it warm or cold? Is the pre-existing conditions, do they have any VSD, tetralogy of flow? What's the duration of no flow during a cardiac arrest? What's the initial ECG rhythm? And what's the quality of life-saving interventions that we provide in the pre-hospital setting? If we don't get a pulse back by the time they get to the hospital, the child is dead. Uh, very rarely, if you do get that person back, you can have an organ donor. So your golden window is your 10, 11 minute transport time from the contact to the hospital. If you look at, since 2001, did a study, and if you look at in-hospital cardiac arrest, ROSC has improved, and also survival of discharge has improved. However, the same time, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest has been dismal. 8.3% survival, that is in the Rock trial, in all age groups. So to keep perspective, if you look at in-hospital cardiac arrest, survival has gone up significantly. Out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, it's been dismal. What are the variables? If you look at out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, primarily respiratory problems, poor survival rates, rarely witnessed, unknown downtime, poor bystander CPR rates, and very rarely shockable rate, uh, rhythms. In hospital, 70% survival, 30% survival of discharge, neurologically intact was high. It's always witnessed. Children are usually monitored, so there's a big advantage. Initial rhythms, PEA and asystole, 82% of the time. VFib, 18. If you add bystander CPR to the equation, and this is something we really need to be engaged in the community to do, unwitnessed bystander CPR, Survival is 4.7%. With witness cardiac arrest, with bystander CPR, the survival is double. So we really need to engage the community. There are four phases of cardiac arrest. There's a pre-arrest, the no-flow state, which is your crit critical uh, criteria, your low-flow state, and the post-resuscitation. 
You guys seen this one? You guys have done this, right? <laughs> we still do that, right? <laughs> so the AHA elements for chain of survival, obviously you want to prevent this occurring. You want to have early high quality CPR. You want to call for help for bystanders, implement advanced life support for pediatrics, and aggress aggressive post-resuscitation care. The adult cardiac arrest is completely different than a pediatric cardiac arrest in their initial approach. Airway is number one for kids. It's not necessarily number one for adults. ABC has been the mantra for a long time since uh, till about 2010 when it became CAB. With children, it's still ABC because airway is number one priority for kids. When you do the ventilatory rate, when you post intubate children, what is your ventilatory rate that you have for children? What are you guys run, running at right now? Anybody in EMS right now? If you have a child come into your ER as a pediatric arrest, how many times a minute are you bagging that patient? What's the respiratory therapist doing? Yeah, what's the respiratory therapist doing while you're in full blown panic mode? 60 a minute, right? So that's going to be very, very productive. So remember, the optimal ventilatory rates are one every 10 seconds. So we actually implemented that in the field. High ventilatory rates increase intrathoracic pressure, which decreases venous return. So what we've kind of implemented an idea that Paul brought to us is called permissive hypercarbia. And what we've done is kind of a little modification on that. Um, but this is basically when you don't do, when you pause with compressions, you see suddenly there's a drop in circulatory uh, perfusion, so the goal is to continuously do CPR on these children. When you intubate them, a, you have a cuffed endotracheal tube, and under the age of eight, uh, that's okay. Aggressive early airway management, permissive hypercarbia, what is that? It's controlled mechanical hypoventilation. You want to be able to regulate your CO2 increase, and your ventilatory state must equal your perfusion state. What are the side effects that you want from pediatric hypercarbia? You increase sympathetic tone, you increase cardiac contractility, and you may cause dysrhythmias from it. CNS effects, vasodilation, elevated intracranial pressure, and you actually can lower your th uh, seizure threshold. The oxygen component, which is the reason we do this, it shifts your carboxyhemoglobin curve to the right. So what that does, it means you retain and hold on to oxygen in the system of the children. Renal side effects, you release vasopressin. From the vasopressin release, you increase uh, uh, systemic vasodilation. So these are all the positive signs for it. When would you not do permissive hypercarbia? It's when you would basically have, have active seizures, pulmonary hypertension, elevated intracranial pressure, severe hypertension, and sickle cell. We really need to engage our community. Bystander CPR, as we showed, has a two to one improvement on survival rates. Sadly, the integration of bystander CPR is the same in adults as it is in pediatrics. Remember, children do have a little reservoir that they can use in low flow states. CPR fractions. Who knows what a CPR fraction is? So CPR fraction is the amount of time you spent on a chest. Ideally, 100%. To be successful, you need to have it about 80 to 90% range to get good outcomes. 
Coronary perfusion pressure is needed to have 15 millimeters of mercury to get good ROSC rates and, and survival rates with that. Compression rates are going to be about 100 to 120. Chest recoil is imperative because what you're doing is you're going to refill the coronary arteries on recoil. Don't lean on the chest when you're doing compressions. It impedes venous return, decreases cardiac output, all bad side effects. Duration of CPR. You can continue CPR over 20 minutes post arrest. What we do is look at end tidal CO2. If your end tidal CO2 is greater than 10, we continue compressions and resuscitation. If your end tidal is less than 10, we stop it if it's been that way for a prolonged period of time, i.e. 20 minutes. For in hospital, survival, over 35 minutes is 12% survival. And if you look at that, greater than 35 minutes, neurologic outcomes are 60%. This is the overall data from this is 2013 Sudden Cardiac Arrest Foundation. You look at the resuscitation rates for EMS patients, for shockable, pediatrics, and overall, the numbers are pretty dismal. This is where we are, as we've kind of talked about in the last lecture, which we kind of left and came back, is uh, we're a pretty large system, 2,000 square miles, 39th largest fire department in the United States, and we run about 100 and plus thousand calls a year. So what were our pre-hospital issues with pediatric arrest? Between 2012 and 13, every kid died. We worked every kid. We got a couple of ROSCs back. Our ROSC rates were 5 or 11 percent, but everybody died. But what we did was we followed what everybody else did. So pre-hospital setting, what are people normally using? In general for resuscitation. What? Correct. So what do you guys, I mean, anybody here in EMS right now? So what do you guys, what do your uh, crews use for pediatric arrest? It's just whatever AHA does, right? And so we did that too, and basically we found that everybody died. We basically only do 30 cases a year, so we really weren't very good at it. It was really hard figuring out what math doses and how to reconstitute the right dose for the right child. We use a length best tape forever, and our survival rates were pretty, pretty dismal. We also were using a non-rebreather mask versus early intubation for pediatric arrest. We would actually go on scene. The reason the medics would scoop, take the patient, and take him right at the back of the truck. Why would they do that? They're totally intimidated. Because they're scared, because it's really bad to look bad in front of a parent that's freaking out and you really don't know what you do. When you have an adult resuscitation, what do they do? If you have an 80-year-old guy on the couch in cardiac arrest, what do you do? You work him there, right? Because you're comfortable with that. With a kid, the reason they take him and go somewhere else is because they don't know what to do and they're not comfortable, so they go someplace where nobody can see them. Now, if you don't work an adult cardiac arrest for five minutes, what are your chances of having a good outcome? Bad, right? So why would you not initiate care on scene? We had very poor community awareness, so we knew we needed to make changes. We looked at the length best tape. What were we doing wrong? We were just doing exactly what this tape was telling us to do. A couple of mistakes. Epinephrine, 2.1 milligrams. If you look at that, that's 10 times the dose that you should actually be giving a child. How much milligrams of epinephrine do you give an adult? So when you have regular code, how much FP you're given? One, right? So here you're giving 2.1, but if you look really carefully, it's endotracheal. But in the heat of business, in the panic of is that you don't very good at, what mistake are you going to make? So fentanyl, 63 micrograms of fentanyl. This is six times higher than the regular dose you'd give anybody. Actually, three times. So. And for a Versed, it's three times higher than the dose you would normally give an adult. So we switched to this system called the Hantevi system. Basically, it was very simplified math. And your thumb, if you're one year old, your index finger, if you're three years old, your middle finger, if you're five years old, your, your ring finger, if you're seven, and your little pinky, if you're nine years old. So if someone gives you the bird, they're just saying they're five years old, right? Simple. 10 milligrams, so the 10 kilograms is the weight of the one-year-old. That's the average weight. 15 is the, for the three-year-old, 20 kilograms for the five-year-old, 25 for the seven-year-old, 
and nine, for the nine-year-old, they're going to average 30 kilograms. That's your simple math. You already know what weight you are. Now you calculate what doses you need. Things we made differences. We changed from active to passive. Uh, we decided to go from non-rebreather to actually on-scene in endotracheal intubation. We applied this physiology. We stayed on scene. Endo endotracheal intubation or supraglottic care on scene. We actually fully implemented the system in 2016, and we were giving epi on scene within two minutes. So the scoop and run was wrong. You kill precious time because you're wasting time not treating the patient. Also, the parents are freaking out because you just take that child away. When you're working in a hospital and you want to are not comfortable with the patient doing well, what do you do with the family? You kind of bring them in, right? Here you're kind of shutting them out. So stay on scene, early interventions, early IO, early epi, early intubation. We controlled, after we got the initial bag valve, we intubated within two minutes on scene. We regulated breathing at one every 10 seconds. We had mild permissive hypercapnia between 40 to 50. And that's uh, eye gel we have here. So what's the bottom line? We like the hand heavy system because it tailored for what we wanted to do. You minimize low flow states because you're working the child immediately on scene. You don't need to think anymore because the math is already done and the calculations and the dose is already pre-calculated for you. Using an age-based criteria, based on your age, we have a weight, we give you the average dose of what, what you need for that time. We have less errors. The reason pediatric arrests are really hard to do because not everybody can regulate and remember what dose you of epinephrine you need to give a five-year-old because you're looking through the book and trying to calculate, this eliminates that problem. The consistency of care is easy. Paramedic training is easy. So something I can implement and educate much more simply than I was before. So the summary is, there's no silver bullet. You can't just do one thing. It has to be everything on scene. Initially, it's CPR on scene, eye gel, control ventilations. It helps paramedic confidence. We did TV ads. We educated around the community to get a heightened awareness. We live in an area where a lot of the British tourists come in. It's right near Disney. And they have pools for the first time they've ever had. They don't know how to regulate pools. They don't know about pool guards. They don't watch their kids. Most of our drownings, and we have about 30 to, 45, 30 to 40 drownings a year, all happen in this basically one area. So we had 39 pediatric arrests last year, of which 35 were in this one area where they were all drownings. So this was one of those education things we had. Now, what we did was, this is the, the mantra that we wanted the medics to follow. You arrive on scene, initial bag valve mask, start initial chest compressions, drill with an IO, immediate epinephrine, and that's two minutes. After two minutes, what are the medics doing? You're intubating. So I'm going to have Dr. Pepe explain the research that we had behind that. You're winging it again. Okay. Yeah. And Dr. Pepe is a giant in EMS. Oh, you actually have it? Excellent. So him and Dr. Ganti have both helped uh, get this research initiated. Yes.